Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, JSON Data Modeling and Document Database, sponsored today by Couchbase. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To access the Q&A or the chat panels, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Matthew Groves. Matthew is a guy who loves to code. Doesn't matter if it's C Sharp, jQuery, or PHP, he'll submit requests for anything. He has been coding professionally ever since he wrote a quick, basic point of scale app for his parents' pizza shop back in the 90s. He currently works as the product marketing manager for Couchbase. And with that, I will give the floor to Matthew to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hi, thanks very much, Shannon. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. All right, excellent. Well, welcome everybody. We're going to talk about some JSON data modeling today, because if you're like me, and I know I am, uh, if you think data modeling and databases, you usually think of modeling it like this, like a relational table-based model. And if you want the benefits of a non-relational database and the benefits of a JSON database, you may have to start thinking a little differently about how you model data. Uh, now, fortunately, uh, Couchbase, with today's sponsor, is, is going to give us some familiar tools uh, uh, of the relational world with the NoSQL JSON world. So we're gonna go into that today. We're gonna spend a little bit of time uh, talking about why NoSQL is important, why people use NoSQL, why you might want to consider using NoSQL, and then we'll get into the JSON data modeling and how it's different uh, than relational modeling. And uh, along with that, along with just modeling, we have to think about how we're going to access our data because that might also affect how we model data as well. And then we'll spend a little bit of time on migrating data. I have a, I have a short demo as well showing some data migration from relational world to Couchbase. And uh, I'll use any time we have left to answer your questions or uh, respond to your comments. So please leave those in, in the Q&A or the, or the chat or Twitter or wherever you'd like to. And, and I'll take a look at those uh, when I get to them. So let's talk about why NoSQL in the first place. Why, uh, why even look at a NoSQL database? So let's, let's just talk about what NoSQL is first, because it's kind of a broad category. It doesn't really have much technical meaning to it. But generally, it refers to databases that either lack SQL or don't use a relational model. Now, uh, once the SQL language becomes optional, historically speaking, and transactions become optional, there's been a, a huge flurry of databases that were using distinct approaches for very common use cases. So for instance, key value uh, provides quick access to data for a given key. Uh, wide column can store a large number of arbitrary columns in each row. Uh, graph databases store data as relationships uh, and relationship as first class concepts. Uh, document databases, they aggregate data into a hierarchical structure. Uh, what JSON is a means to an end there, right? Uh, so document databases is what we're gonna be focusing mainly on today. It's probably the closest to a all purpose NoSQL database and the closest to a relational database. Uh, so it's a good starting point to talk about a JSON modeling there. So, yeah, so when we look at document databases, they originally came from kind of the key value uh, world, uh, a minimal set of APIs to access data by keys, but then uh, some indexing added onto that. If we're storing data as JSON in a regular format or, or XML, but usually JSON, then we can start to index that data and query that data by a secondary attribute, not just the key, but what is actually in the data itself. And so this gives us the, the buzzword NoSQL because there's NoSQL involved in operating with any of those. But as, as we're going to see, uh, that's actually not really accurate anymore. Uh, SQL has, has come to the NoSQL world, making it even less useful of a technical term. So it basically it means all data can be stored and retrieved differently than relational databases. So think of a, a document database as a very simple type of key value store where the value is in a known format. Uh, and generally speaking, you're gonna code where you start with a key and you ask the database to return that document that corresponds to that key. That's how a key value database works. The difference here is that those brackets there that show doc one, doc two, doc n, those contain JSON and we can do some lookups based on the values of, the, of JSON as well. 
So with that in mind, a very quick overview of what NoSQL is, what actually are the reasons that people go to NoSQL? And the original main reason that NoSQL came about was for scalability. And uh, what's going on is, is something called horizontal scaling. It's where we're, we have a distributed database, distributed computing amongst multiple machines that communicate and coordinate over a network. And if we need more capacity, we add more nodes, more servers to that cluster. And we keep doing that as we need to add more capacity. So we're scaling out instead of scaling a single database up to a more expensive uh, single, still single node machine. And so this can provide a lot of benefits in terms of uh, elastic scaling, uh, responding to demand, uh, cost-effective scaling. Uh, so for example, if a, a popular TV show uh, premieres on Sunday nights, uh, then a uh, media service like uh, Sky TV, for instance, or Peacock or something uh, may need, uh, may have a, a lot more demand Sunday night than it does on say Tuesday afternoon. And so they need to uh, scale up to meet that demand. But on Tuesday afternoon, they don't necessarily need all that capacity so they can scale back down uh, like so to you know, save on costs. So that's one reason is, is scaling. Flexibility, and I'm kind of seeing a, a little bit of a sarcastic comment here. And this is kind of the reason that appeals to uh, developers is a flexibility. It's the easier management of change in business requirements and easier management of change in the structure of the data. Um, and, and this is a, a, a you know, benefit if you're doing some sort of agile development, so you can just change things as you go. Um, sometimes it's a benefit if you're pulling data together from multiple sources, uh, and that flexibility really helps data ingestion as well. Now, a document database, uh, generally speaking, you're storing data as JSON. Uh, there's a required key that has to be unique. Otherwise, there's no rigid schema involved with this data. Each piece of data is independent. Uh, so you can do whatever the heck you want with the data, right? But uh, that being said, you shouldn't. There still is a schema there, even though it's implied. Uh, so you should still have some discipline about your data. And we'll talk about that uh, today. Availability is another important one. This is kind of related to scaling. If one machine goes down in uh, a cluster of machines, then uh, the system can stay online because other systems still available. This is a picture I took of my wife. Oh, geez, it's got to be six years ago at this point, five, six years ago at this point, we were watching Wonder Woman. So you can, you can date it to that. But we were at a movie theater and uh, one of the machines was undergoing some sort of maintenance. It was broken or needed refill or something like that. But because they had multiple machines there, a cluster of Coke machines in this case, we could still get our service before the movie. We didn't have to stand there and wait for the machine to uh, get serviced because there's only one machine or, you know, potentially uh, not get a drink, right? Not be able to make a purchase because the machine was down. And so this is uh, a very nice thing to have for availability because uh, it means less downtime if hardware fails or you know if a, a cloud uh, data center fails, something like that. And for maintenance and upgrading, uh, we can upgrade or maintain or fix one machine without any downtime. The other machines can uh, still, um, uh, still service your use cases, still service your customers. And of course, speed is one people talk about a lot. Uh, I'd, I'd like to be more specific and when I talk about speed, we're talking about latency, we're talking about how much concurrency is involved. NoSQL systems are optimized for specific access patterns. We'll talk about that today. And uh, you know, Couchbase specifically has a built-in cache, a memory-first architecture, which gives it some really, really good speed. Um, so th that's what I like to talk about. We can certainly talk about benchmarks, things like that, but the architecture, integrated cache, these are the things that uh, give it the speed. And that's what I want to focus on more is, is, okay, it's faster, why is it faster? And how can I take advantage of that? Use cases for NoSQL, you know, I've been giving a version of this presentation, it's, it's changed a lot over the years, but a version of this presentation for five plus years. And the, this list is something I keep adding to all the time because NoSQL keeps maturing and adding more uh, features, um, adding more use cases. So. Um, you know, I, I didn't start with finance and inventory and healthcare on this list, but they're there now because NoSQL databases, especially Couchbase, are maturing and adding the features that these sectors, these use cases need. Um, now, using a NoSQL database does not mean you have to abandon relational databases. You know, most large companies, most large websites use a combination. And it's also worth pointing out that plenty of companies that are, are doing most of these things with relational, right? So, Relational usually is at least a mediocre 
choice for something, uh, you know, NoSQL may be better for some things. Uh, but usually the catalyst for NoSQL is one of those reasons I mentioned earlier. And, and just one of my favorite quotes here, just to bring home that point that different isn't always better, but better is always different. So it's definitely worth keeping an open mind about NoSQL and the benefits of it. So with that in mind, let's get into some modeling. That's what we're all here for, right? Uh, so, um, you know, some of the comments are talking about making it up as you go. Uh, planning is definitely still required, uh, no matter if using NoSQL or relational, right? So let's let's look at, uh, we're planning out a, uh, a model of a customer on a whiteboard, perhaps. Uh, we might do this as part of a proof of concept or uh, discovery, requirements gathering, you know, some sort of planning meeting. And there are some things that we know about this customer as we've drawn them. This, this crude picture that I drew myself by hand. There's four attributes here I wanna focus on. And one is that there is a rich structure to this customer, right? So we have each customer has a number of attributes like name or date of birth and so on, and potentially sub attributes. So name might be first name, last name. Uh, date of birth might be month, day, year, so, something like that. We have relationships in this data. Um, you know, potentially to other data, like other customers in this case. We've got, uh, Helen here has connections to uh, three other uh, customers in the system. Maybe they're sharing a, an account on, uh, you know, a streaming service or Amazon or something like that. We have a value evolution that's possible, right? So we can start with, uh, Helen has uh, one purchase of a laptop and she, as she makes another purchase, we can evolve those values to contain multiple purchases. I, I call that value evolution. And the last one is structure evolution. This one's a little trickier to do uh, with relational databases. So perhaps we start with uh, Helen having a, a credit card number as one of her attributes, right? But uh, a requirement comes down that, hey, we need multiple payment options for each customer, multiple billing options. Well, if we made the mistake of uh, you know, creating a, a column in the customer table, for instance, of credit card number, then we have to go back and, and refactor our uh, data um, to accommodate that and, and change our schema and update this, the, the, uh, the code that deals with that. So this is an example of, I showed you this earlier, this is an example of how we might model that customer, right? So we start out with a rich structure, right? So we've got attributes inside the customer table. We've got relationships to other data, you know, via contacts, via purchases, via connections. We've got a value evolution. So we can add additional rows to any of these tables and evolve the value. The structure evolution is more difficult. I want you to imagine if that billing table wasn't here and we put a credit card number column inside of customer. If we wanna evolve that structure to accept multiple uh, credit cards, uh, multiple billing options, then we have to uh, remove that column from customer, uh, add a billing uh, table, add a foreign key constraint, and uh, you know, make all those changes to the schema. And that can be uh, very time consuming, especially if these are large tables that can involve some downtime with our relational databases. So that's uh, a very difficult uh, part of evolving structure in the relational world. And that's why I think developers really value the flexibility of a document database. So let's go through a little more concrete example. We're gonna have relational here on the left and we're going to have what it might look like in a a document database on the right. So this is a pretty straightforward translation here, if you will. Uh, we've got a, uh, a table with a primary key and, and the relational database, we have a document that has a document key and those uh, can match up exactly. We can go from the column name to a key value pair in JSON. And again, that matches up pretty straightforward there. So uh, that is a very easy translation going from flat data to flat data, not a big deal at all. Let's start making it a little more complex though. We've got now a purchases table. So this customer uh, has one or more purchases, right? So we've got a separate table called purchases that has a foreign key that points back to the customer. Um, over on the document, however, we still got just the one document and I've got a purchases array now that contains those items. And so notice in those purchases, there is no foreign key because that is no longer foreign data. It's now domestic data. Right, so we have two pieces of data in two tables versus one document uh, with one JSON object in it. And if we wanna evolve the value, add more uh, purchases, then we have uh, three rows of data in two tables 
versus our document is still just one piece of data in JSON over there. All right, so you can see where that's going. Pretty straightforward to just embed those purchases into the customer document. Uh, if we want to get more complex and have a connection from one customer to another customer, well, we can't really embed that customer inside of another customer because then it would just be you know, embedding uh, forever. It's an N plus one type problem. So in the relational world, we typically have what's called a mapping table or you know, many to many table, whatever you want to call it, that has a, uh, a primary key that contains two foreign keys and then maybe some information about that relationship. We can do a similar thing in JSON world. We can add a connections array that points to another document by the key there. So in this case, our customer Jane Smith uh, is connected to uh, a father via uh, another document that the father has, SKR007. So again, we don't have to have both keys because it is domestic now, but we can still connect to those other documents and, and just look them up by their key. And so finally, uh, we have a JSON document that represents a customer. Now in a single JSON document, the relationship between the data is implicit by use of substructures and arrays of substructures, right? And this is what I was talking about earlier with evolving the data now. Notice we've got the card number there in the customer table. That's a rookie mistake, right? But it's uh, something we can uh, you know, demonstrate uh, here in a simple way. If we want to change that to support multiple methods of payment, we have to go and add a billing table and move that data from the customer table into the billing table. We'll probably have to change a lot of um, code as well that uh, involves customer and, and billing information. But over in the JSON world, um, I've, I've used billing as an array. And so it's embedded right there in the document. Now, one thing you might not have noticed because it's a little subtle is that on this slide, uh, the key is CBL 2015. And on this slide, the key is CBL 2016. Now, both those documents can exist in the same database. So we're not defining upfront that we have to have card number, expiry, and card type, or billing. We can just change those as we need to. We have flexibility to change the way we read and write documents as we go. So that is uh, something that, you know, coming from a relational background may, be a, may worry you a little bit because you're thinking, well, now data is just going to be all over the place. It's going to have, uh, it's going, I'm not going to be able to rely on uh, what, how this data is going to be stored. And so that's, you know, that's a valid concern. There's certainly ways to deal with that. But um, just remember that this is not, uh, this is a trade-off involved here. We're gaining the flexibility in exchange for more responsibility of how we read and write our data. So I want to go th quickly through three different versioning approaches because I get asked about this a lot. So I eventually added it into this uh, slide deck just some high level ideas about how you might approach this issue of your data changing going forward and how to be uh, more robust about that. So one approach is just by using versioning numbers in your document. So for example, I've got version one on the left that just has a name field. And uh, I wanna break those out into first name and last name. So starting with version two, now we have first name and last name. Uh, and, and we can now look at that version number in our application code and say, well, if it's version one, we have to use this class. And if it's version two, we have to use this class. Or we can build some logic into the classes. If, if our classes are a little more intelligent, right? Uh, we can put some logic in those classes and they're not, they're not just straightforward DTOs anymore. They actually have some uh, of this logic in them and that will figure it out as it goes. And name then becomes a computed uh, field in our class, for instance, our Java class or our C-sharp class. Another approach is a big bang reversioning, right? So we just go in and we do a big update statement on all the data to uh, split it out. Now that is easier said than done for first name and last name, right? Uh, but uh, it's, it's not Im completely impossible or intractable, uh, but other types of data, it's a little more straightforward. So we just go ahead and, and update document 12902 and we remove the name field and we add first name and last name fields uh, with the appropriate values. Now, this can be a big update or a series of batch updates. And this is something that you typically have to do in relational as well, right? Uh, although this might require, again, might require downtime to make this kind of change, or you'll end up with, you know, kind of um, uh, obsolete fields littered throughout your tables, which is not uncommon to see in the relational world. Uh, another one is uh, what I'm calling cooperative reversioning. So let's say you have a web application 
that accesses uh, a piece of data in the course of normal operations. So it may access uh, a user profile. But while we're accessing that data, when we go to save it, go back to write it to the database, let's change it to the new format. So as people uh, log in and use the system, the data gets reversioned to the new model gradually. And the data that's in the old format is basically data that's not even in use right now. So you can kind of take this approach with the relational as well. It gets a little messy because you'll end up with a name and a first name and a last name column all in the same table and a lot of null values, which I'm sure no one here has ever seen before, right? Uh, but in a document database, you don't need a bunch of those nulls hanging around. You can split name into first, last name, and then ditch name on a per document basis. So these are just three approaches. There's others that are more complex out there. You can use uh, any of these three or a combination of them or, or, or you know, whatever you think is the best approach to dealing with that. And I'd love to hear your comments if you've gone through this process before, how you uh, dealt with this issue. And again, to, to go back into some of the discussion going on about uh, just changing data willy-nilly and, and not planning and, and just going uh, like it's the Wild West, um, you know, that may be an organizational or team issue. There are some tools out there that uh, help your team get on the same page about modeling. Um, so th something like Hackalate supports uh, Couchbase and, and many other NoSQL tools and, and Erwin DM uh, NoSQL, uh, which also supports Couchbase. Even something as simple as like JSON editor online.org, which is a, it's a no frills, but totally free offering. This can help you with modeling, can help you with diffing. These can help you uh, maintain a little more robustness about how you're modeling your data. So um, it might be worthwhile if you're concerned about this to you know, put a process in place, put some tools in place to uh, help manage uh, the structure of your data. Okay, so we want kind of a whiteboard exercise there. What I wanna look at now is uh, some other things that may affect how you model your data. And one of them is, you know, how do you plan to access your data? Uh, your data? Because this can also affect the way you model your data. So with relational, you really only have the one way to access data, that's a SQL query. No matter what you're doing, it's ultimately going to be a SQL query that's a reading and writing data. With a NoSQL database, you have multiple ways to access data, including, uh, ironically, uh, these days, SQL you can use on a NoSQL database. So uh, just uh, to talk about key value, I mentioned this earlier on. If you know the key already, it's really simple and extremely fast to access that piece of data by its key directly. This is a uh, C-sharp example. Um, you know, I'm not going to... Uh, go into too much more detail with C-sharp, but uh, kind of get the idea here is that we get an ID as a parameter, we look up that ID in a collection and return that as a shopping cart class, right? We didn't use any SQL uh, to do this. We're just going right through the, uh, in this case, Couchbase SDKs uh, to read data by its, by its uh, key. And the same thing down there at the, the second function, we're creating a shopping cart and uh, I'm just passing in a new shopping cart object uh, that gets serialized to JSON ultimately from a C-sharp object. And in this case, it's got a GUID as the ID. So I'm not using an insert there either. Uh, I'm using the key value API directly. So it's not being turned into an insert or being turned into a select. It's, it's actually using the NoSQL APIs um, directly. Some recommendations if you are going the key value route. Um, since key value is so fast and easy, it's going to benefit you uh, to use it as much as possible. And if you're going the key value route, uh, some of the things you can do is use a natural key. So I've, I've showed GUID in the last uh, slide, and you can use a GUID. It doesn't really have any meaning, though. But if you can uh, use a natural key, something that's um, you know, not going to be uh, changed very often in your system, uh, an account number, for instance, a driver's license number, an ISBN for a book. You know, once it's assigned, it doesn't doesn't change very often. And make them human readable, right? So a GUID is not human readable at all. We can't tell anything about it uh, from that GUID. So maybe user one two three or something like that tells us that it's a user document in there. And uh, if you construct your keys in a way like this, that they're human readable and and have natural keys, we can make them deterministic. And I'll show you what I mean by that in the next slide how this can benefit you. And ultimately, all these things are gonna uh, give your keys some meaning. They're gonna make them semantic. Um, and what I'm not showing yet is that NoSQL databases like Couchbase, which I'll show you later, have concepts of scopes and collections that allow you to further organize your data. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, especially when I get to the demo. So here's a quick example, if you're using key value, of how 
uh, deterministic keys are going to be helpful. I'm not going to read this all to you. Maybe you want to take a screenshot and look at it later. But basically, we're, we're walking our way through a, a graph of different pieces of data uh, without using any sort of joins, any sort of SQL queries. We're just going straight through key value lookup. So uh, we have a username given to us. We can look up that user. And from there, we can go to that user's blogs. And from there, we can go to the blog itself. And from there, we can go to the comments of the blog. And we can do this with just, uh, this particular path here has just four lookups. And you know, four operations may seem like a lot uh, from the relational world, right? We don't wanna execute four different select queries, but the key value uh, lookup is so much faster that uh, chances are it's going to be a lot quicker to go through this than a, a single uh, type of uh, select or join sort of overhead. Okay, uh, some other things to think about when you're modeling your data. And these are just some rules of thumb, some strategies that I would, I would recommend uh, you uh, go this way. Uh, so relationship is, uh, let's say it's one-to-one -one or it's one-to-many, uh, then it's going to benefit you to store that related data as nested objects, right? So just like we had with uh, the customer earlier with the purchases array. If your data, however, is many-to-one or many-to-many, then it makes sense to store them as separate documents. Uh, as we showed with uh, connections earlier, we have uh, Jane Smith connected to other customers. We don't want to nest those um, because it's a many to, many to one or many to many. And if we're doing a read that's mostly uh, parent fields, for instance, then we can store those children as separate documents. We don't need to pull all that data back in one operation. Uh, we can store them as separately. And uh, just, kind of see where this is going. If we're doing a parent and child read together, then it might make sense to store them as nested objects. So a shopping cart, for instance, might make sense to store all those items as nested objects. because We're often pulling back the entire shopping cart uh, in an operation. If we're doing rights, and again, hopefully you see where this is going. If we're doing rights to mostly parent or child, then we can store them as separate documents because we wanna change them on their own individually without having to modify the whole uh, the whole document. And uh, if we're doing a right to a parent and child both together, then again, it makes sense to store those as nested objects there uh, as one document instead of multiple. So I just went through these six really quickly here. These are, again, not hard and fast rules, but they're a good place to start. It's a, it's a good rule of thumb to think about uh, how am I going to read and write my data? And we'll start with uh, these rules and adjust them as we need to. And uh, one other thing you think about is does your database have a sub-document access? So this can vary from database to database. Um, so one thing to consider is, is there a sub-document API or whatever it's called available? And if you do have that, then you get even more flexibility with how you model your data. Uh, the idea is this, if I just need to update an address of a person, let's say uh, the person document is, is uh, very large. We don't wanna necessarily transport all across the wire just to make one change to like the address. So if we can just use a sub-document API and specify just the address is what I wanna update. I wanna read just the address or I wanna write just the address. Uh, then we can go ahead and use a sub-document API to just uh, work on that part. So this is helpful for very large documents. Um, if you only need a small portion of the data. So to keep that in mind, if your database has that, that's another way you can Another thing to take in mind when you're modeling your data. So I've been mostly talking about key value access. Uh, most NoSQL databases will have at least one other way to access data besides key value. And what does that have to do with modeling? Well, because modeling doesn't exist in a vacuum, you have to think about how you're going to interact with your data. So I'm going to show you some examples from Couchbase. Uh, in Couchbase, we have what's called SQL++. That's an ANSI SQL implementation for JSON data. And I'm also going to briefly show full text search FTS today. There's other options I'm not going to cover like analytics and, uh, and mobile. Um, uh, I'm not gonna have time to get into those, but notice they all operate on the same documents, the same set of data. So we're not copying data to different services. It's all in the same, uh, the same core data. And these services are all uh, operating on that. So key value, as you can see, goes directly to the documents versus a SQL query has to go through, an, usually has to go through an index service and full text search has to go through an index service and so on. 
So there's some overhead involved with those. SQL++ is a uh, powerful, flexible, declarative nature, right? It's familiar to developers. You have joins available there as well. Um, but notice once we step out of key value access, we need to involve other processes, right? We've got to parse that query. We've got to use an index service most likely. Uh, and in the end, what it's ultimately going to do in the case of Couchbase, it's going to, uh, again, behind the scenes, it's going to use that key value lookup to retrieve the data. So there is overhead involved, but oftentimes this is a necessity. You know, we, we can't look up data just by its key for our use case, right? So as an example here, if we wanted to find all users that have a Visa or MasterCard, uh, you know, that's not going to be stored in the, in the key of the document. So we have to look at those secondary attributes. We have to look inside the data itself and index, in this case, the type, uh, which is Visa or MasterCard in this query. And so, of course, just like in relational, if you're in SQL, you have to understand your query plan. And this is true for any database, right? Including NoSQL. So this is a Couchbase SQL++ query. I execute this and it, and it ran in, uh, I think, 1.2 seconds. I ran that locally. It's using an index on the, uh, on the uh, name field here, I think, or no, maybe it's using a primary index in this case. And I can bring up a visualization of that query plan to see which parts are taking up the most time, right? So the green ones are relatively fast uh, as they uh, approach orange and dark orange and red. They're the ones that take up most of the percentage of the execution plan. Uh, so we can see here that the, the fetch here is uh, taking a lot of the time, taking 79.1% of that uh, computation time. Uh, now in Couchbase, there's something called an index advisor. This is something you're familiar with in the, uh, um, uh, probably from relational world as well. Uh, but I can click on this button and it'll select or suggest an index for me to add to improve the uh, performance of that query. All right, so uh, this is uh, saying I should uh, index the, the name uh, field there. Um, that might give us some better performance. It's not going to be perfect, but uh, we, can, we can look into that. Uh, a covering index might make this even faster, right? So notice we're doing select uh, star up there on line one. Probably select star, uh, unless you absolutely need everything, you should probably avoid that and just select the fields that you want. And if we only need two or three fields from this query, we can create a covering index. So we don't even have to go. We can skip that fetch step completely, get the data right from the index, right? Just uh, cross that right out. So that would take out our slowest part of the query to do that. Again, assuming you, you only need a few, you know, handful of those, right? If, if you actually do need a, a dot star, well, then uh, we have to uh, look into other index strategies. Okay, so that's, uh, that's your standard query, SQL query. Uh, another thing we can do is a full text search, right? So this is like a Google search for your data where we're searching for uh, uh, text, uh, in, you know, language aware, uh, queries, we might want to search and, and rank them in results uh, in order of their, um, you know, um, how relevant they are, relevancy scores, right? So just an example here, I've got a full text search. I've created an index already, and I'm searching for the keyword submarine. We might get back as some results. Uh, we're searching landmarks in this case, and we can see that it's highlighting the word submarine, and it's ranked that first landmark there is the highest, you know, probably because it has submarine in there twice. And there's all kinds of interesting syntax things we can do. This is a very simple example. We could do uh, stemming and it's you know, language aware. So this is English. We can change it to other languages, uh, pluralizations and all kinds of other filters. We can even use full text search for geospatial queries to search by uh, you know, uh, points on a map, that sort of thing. So to sum up here, uh, you know, this is something you'd want to go through as you're building out your proof of concept to see if NoSQL is the right fit. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at these things that are all, all going to affect modeling, right? Uh, I would say go to key value operations uh, if you can. Uh, if you're doing a text-based search, go to full text search. And if you're doing anything beyond that, go down to, uh, well, it used to be called nickel, but SQL++ is what we're calling it now. And uh, you can, those are different strategies you can use depending on how you want to access your data. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about migrating data here. And this is a, a, large, uh, a large area of uh, questions I usually get. Um, and uh, there's a spectrum of approaches. These are some of the typical options for migration. And I've, I've mapped these out from risk and effort the highest risk and highest effort are the ones on top and the lowest risk 
lowest effort is one on the bottom. And of course, the trade-off there is that uh, I'm not going to necessarily get all the benefits of NoSQL if I start down at the lower end of this spectrum, five and four. But it might be where I want to start just to, you know, for a proof of concept or to get comfortable with that. And again, I'm using the term migration here, but it might not be the case that you're abandoning uh, a database in favor of another one. You might want to sync data between them. You might want to make a copy into a more suitable database for your use case, you know, offload from a mainframe, that sort of thing. There are some uh, tools out there uh, in place that allow you to do this uh, and help help you go through this process. So these are a few. Uh, GlueSync is one that's very interesting. It's, uh, it's a real-time synchronization tool that goes between, um, let's say, I think popular databases like Oracle and SQL Server over to Couchbase. Uh, NiFi is a very cool uh, data flow tool that you can use to sync data or migrate data as well. Some of these other ones, Informatica, Talons, you may already be familiar with these and you can use those to help migrate your data over. You can also build your own. This will give you some more flexibility as you're, as you're doing some migration of data. So it may be something as simple as a Python script. Uh, Couchbase has a, a, a import tool called CV import. Uh, SQL Server has um, uh, in, in integration services, SSIS. Oracle has Golden Gate and so on. And so these are all tools you can, you can use to help build your migration um, to NoSQL. So some uh, migration options, if you're, if you're, again, just doing a proof of concept or just uh, trying to get started, uh, I would suggest keeping it simple. This is that level five approach I mentioned with an eye towards the level four approach. So you can start, uh, an approach you can start with is just to treat the NoSQL database as a relational database. This is what I'm gonna show you in, in the demo here. Uh, so just don't do any modeling upfront, just import that data and query it in the same way with lots of joins, lots of pieces of data everywhere. And you know, once you've got that in place, you can start to transform that data using the modeling techniques we've discussed to improve performance, uh, reduce the need for joins, and possibly reduce the need for querying, you know, switch over to key value in some cases. So maybe you just do this one entity, one aggregate route at a time, right? Don't start with a user model or start with the user model if that's where your performance uh, you know, is the slowest, you wanna start there. Right, and we'll think about transforming that data in the future, right? So that might be the next step is to actually go, you know, the levels four, three or two, anywhere up the chain possibly. Again, we're doing a proof of concept here. Uh, so we export from relational to CSV. Again, just keeping this really simple. We import that raw data into a staging uh, bucket, say in Couchbase, and then we can transform the data via SQL queries or you know, whatever code we wanna run into our optimized NoSQL bucket. So that's, those are the, that's the really simple approach we can take, and especially for a proof of concept, that's maybe where you wanna go. It's gonna help you uh, adjust that model. Ultimately, I think uh, the key thing I wanna drive home here is, is that we need to align your data model, your migration approach, and your expectations all together. So if you don't model your data to take advantage of JSON and NoSQL, then you're probably not gonna realize that benefit right away. You know, there's nothing, uh, magical about putting data in NoSQL that's going to make it um, automatically faster. We still have to think about uh, you know, how we want to model that data. So I want to take you into a demo here. This will be, uh, we, we're just going to keep this one relatively simple here. I'm going to start with a, a SQL Server database here that I've got running on my machine locally. And uh, I'm using the AdventureWorks sample data set here. And uh, this is, uh, if you're familiar with SQL Server, you've heard of uh, AdventureWorks uh, before. Um, it's, it's a very, it's a sample data set. It's got lots of uh, SQL Server features in it. So schemas and uh, tables in there. So for instance, we've got uh, human resources schema, a person schema. Inside the person schema, we've got address, address type, and so on. So if we go ahead and query the address uh, table here, you can see we've got uh, just a, result of address data. So address, city, state, uh, postal code, spatial location, and so on. That's all in relational data there. Now, uh, I'm not gonna go through the whole uh, process of actually making you wait on this data to move to over to Couchbase. I did that ahead of time. And I've got a Couchbase cluster running here in Couchbase Capella. This is a, a database as a service. It's a, a cloud-based version of Couchbase. And I've got a, you can get a free trial. I'll show you how to do that here. Uh, 
later on, but I've got uh, in here, I've got a cluster already created and an AdventureWorks uh, bucket. And so you can see this bucket corresponds to the database here in SQL Server. All right. So if I go into that, you can see I've got scopes here. So I've got inside Couchbase, I've got these scopes and those all correspond to the schemas. So human resources, person, production, and so on. You see, we've got those all modeled out here. And if we go into, you can see those 13 collections here in person, we'll go into that. And each collection roughly corresponds to a table. So we have person address, person address type, so we've got address and address type here as collections. So that's roughly the way you map uh, from relational directly to Couchbase. You can map bucket to database, you can map um, scope to schema, map collection to table. And then inside of these collections, we've got documents. And these roughly correspond the rows uh, of data in SQL Server to a document in uh, Couchbase. So if I click on one of these, you'll see that there's a JSON data right there in Couchbase. All right, and so that uh, corresponds pretty much directly to the data here in SQL Server. Now notice spatial location in SQL Server is this kind of binary thing that's harder to read. And uh, utility has changed that into a JSON object that contains latitude and longitude that you can see directly there. All right. So now let's go over to a uh, query here. So I showed you, let's see, I showed you the address table, address data move directly. I wanna show you a join query in action here. So I'm joining in this case, person to email address. Let's go back to SQL Server just briefly here. I'll run these three queries. We've got a uh, person, person phone and a person email address. So in relational, we're going to model those as three different tables, right? So person, uh, if you wanna get the phone number, you gotta join the phone number to that person because we wanna have in this case, multiple phone numbers for the person. Same with email address, we could have multiple email addresses for the person. Uh, and so we have three different tables and we join those together typically. And those generally go through in an application to go through an ORM um, object relational mapper uh, to, do the, uh, to handle that impedance mismatch. So uh, over here in Couchbase, the, the data is being stored exactly the same, right? So we still have a person collection and email address collection, right? So if we still wanna do a join between that data, we can do that in Couchbase. We can execute and we get the results there. It is JSON data still, but uh, we could view that as a table. The same kind of results we'd see over in SQL Server. So it's still relational style data uh, with a SQL query with a join here in Couchbase. Now, what we can do is I, I did mention it was SQL++, so it's more than just SQL. We have this other keyword here called nest. And this is going to take the results of the join and nest them in a, uh, an array uh, within the first result set, right? So it'll look a little different. Uh, the result here is going to be, you know, the first name, last name, and an ID, an array of email addresses for Ken Sanchez. And if, if Ken had more than one email address, it'd be, you know, multiple email addresses here that are embedded uh, in the JSON. Now this is a query that's still doing a join to get that result, right? Um, what we might actually wanna consider is do we take this email address and actually put it inside the person documents and just eliminate that email address's collection completely, right? Something we couldn't do in, uh, in the relational world. And I've actually already done that as well uh, ahead of time, just again, to save some time here. So we'll go to collections, and person, and we go over to this person collection. And in there we've got, this is I think Ken Sanchez's document, if I'm not mistaken. So I've already, through my utility, uh, I've um, automatically used those foreign keys to map uh, the, the joins there. So it embeds the email addresses into an array. It embeds the phone numbers into an array and stores them inside this person document, All right? So Ken Sanchez, uh, I can just do one get now to get this complete document as opposed to you know, the, the two or, or more joins that I need to create this document uh, to, to get the same result in my application. Okay, so that is kind of the decision you have to make. That is really the ultimate core of modeling in JSON data. It's 
this decision, do I embed or do I keep my data you know, separate and relational style? That really is the, uh, the key uh, trade-off there and uh, the key decision in, in modeling relational data. Uh, one other thing I, I should mention is, uh, I did mention joins. I think I already mentioned ACID as well. This is an important part uh, is if I, you know, have two, if I'm still modeling my data in relational style where it's in multiple pieces, an ACID transaction is still going to be important if I wanna update those all together. So that is also available here in, in Couchbase and it's very common in NoSQL today to have an ACID transaction. All right. So let's head on back over the slides and wrap up here. So just a few points I wanna drive home um, and then we can get to your questions is, I, I do wanna say pick the right application. And those use cases are definitely growing, but you know, make sure it's, you know, the reason you're getting to NoSQL is uh, something that NoSQL is designed for, right? Is it, is it for scaling? Is it for flexibility? Are there certain performance requirements you need to meet, right? And if you have an architecture that's SOA or microservice or, or some sort of use case specific application, you don't have to rewrite your entire uh, app, right? If you're a monolith, it's gonna be more challenging, but you can slice off one of those microservices and say, well, this is gonna be served better by NoSQL database. And let's, let's try Couchbase there. Let's try a proof of concept with Couchbase. That's the second thing, is try a proof of concept. This is where you can really uh, get into, um, you know, how you wanna model your data. Do we wanna embed? Do we want to uh, keep the data separately? Uh, and, and have a focus in your proof of concept. Just, uh, you know, have some success criteria. What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, let's work through it with a proof of concept. Let's review the architecture. Let's consider some of those modeling tools like Hackalade that I showed earlier, Erwin. Uh, and, uh, and you can just collaborate on that and in a rigorous way and say, is this meeting our requirements or not? We don't have to go all in. We can just try a proof of concept. And then uh, one of the things I definitely want to say is, is a key point of success with modeling data is match, matching the data access uh, method you're using to the requirements, right? In the relational world, we use SQL for everything. Uh, in NoSQL, we have choices. So we don't have to use SQL. We don't have to in, incur the overhead of SQL and indexes for every single time we interact with data, right? So key value is the fastest way, not as flexible, but it's the fastest way. Let's get as much into key value as we can. Uh, full text search for our text and geographic searches. And then uh, finally, we can settle on querying uh, It's because it's flexible and it's familiar. So we can uh, always fall back to that. Next steps for you. What I recommend is you check out the Couchbase Playground. Uh, it's completely free, interactive, online experience, no download required, right in your browser, couchbase.live to start uh, running some code samples uh, right now. If you want to try uh, Couchbase Capella, 30-day uh, free trials going on. You can go sign up for that. No credit card required. It's what I showed today. Everything I showed you uh, in that uh, demo there is was done in Couchbase Capella. So you can all try that there. If you're interested in the SQL Server to Couchbase, it's a totally open source tool. It's my own kind of personal project because I come from a SQL Server background. Um, so you know, if you are interested in that, you know, feel free to drop by, leave a criticism, leave a suggestion. That's where I, I can really respond and, and improve the tool is, uh, is with that kind of interaction. So uh, that's it I have for today. Uh, I think there's a lot of activity that scrolled by in the chat there. Uh, happy to answer any of those questions. Uh, Shannon, do you have any that you have picked out uh, you wanna um, I'm, go over? Yeah, absolutely, Matthew. Thank you so much for this great presentation. If you have questions you'd like me to ask Matthew, it is helpful if you get your questions into the Q&A portion of your screen uh, so I can queue those up there. Uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will uh, send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording, along with anything else here. You know, um, And again, so many, as you mentioned, so many great questions coming through. Uh, in the chat here. Um, is there any limitation for document size? What about blob data types? Okay, so uh, for Couchbase specifically, um, document databases in general definitely have uh, a, a size limit. Couchbase's size limit per document is 20 megabytes. Uh, as far as blob storage, it's it's not really meant for that. It's not that kind of database. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in storing uh, you know, large files, large binaries. Couchbase can store binaries, right? But again, there's a 20 megabyte limit. So you probably want to think about something like, um, you know, uh, your Azure blob storage or your or AWS S3 kind of thing for that. Um, 
Awesome. I'm trying to, again, trying to get through these. Oh, here we go. We got some great questions coming in here. Could you please expand on the uh, deterministic data access? Yes. So that that was all about uh, having a strategy with a key value. So let me, if I can just go back to that. Maybe I can walk through it here. You know, this is something that is, if you want to go, if you want to take advantage of key value as much as possible, this is one way you can do it, right? If this is not important to you, if, if, if you, if you think SQL is going to be the way you want to go, this, this isn't going to matter as much. You can just use GUIDs for the keys, right? But this is just a way of constructing keys in such a way that's going to allow you to do, to stay in key value as much as possible, right? So this is just an example. If I log into a site with my, I type in my username, then I can go look up that document in the author collection by the username, right? And th from there, I have the username token now, and I can look up another document. If that user wants to uh, click on uh, view my blogs, uh, then I can, I know I have the username already, so I can just look for a, uh, a document called author colon colon Matt colon colon blogs. And that will give me a document that contains a list of my blogs perhaps, and so on and so on. So it's deterministic in the way that I can uh, create these keys the same way every time. Right? I don't have to go through an index process uh, for a SQL query to get to a list of blogs, for instance. So that, that's kind of what I was going with there, just as an example. And this is something that is not Couchbase specific. This, can, this strategy can apply to any, uh, any key-based uh, key value document or document database. Awesome. So does defining the cardinality in NoSQL really matter? And is it not easy to determine visually in NoSQL as in uh, ERD? Well, so uh, to answer the second question, the, the visually, visual ERD, um, I did mention a couple tools and I used to demo these, but they weren't, most people weren't really interested in them. So I kind of skipped over this, but a Hackalade uh, demo uh, right here. Hackalade is what I used to demo because it, it is very visual uh, a tool that shows those type of diagrams in a NoSQL environment that shows the relationships between the different types of documents. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. Uh, Hackalade and, and Erwin both do uh, uh, that kind of a visual representation uh, of uh, you know the, the traditional ERD sort of thing. Uh, as far as cardinality, I, I think it, it does really matter. Um, you know, um, I guess it depends on your use case, but. Uh, if, if we're talking, uh, you know, uh, unbounded type of uh, many or one to many type relationship, then that's something you don't want to necessarily embed. I went through that uh, uh, here, like a, like a one to many, right? So, you know, if, if purchases, if there's a lot of purchases, it's probably something we, you know, if, if it's going to be unbounded, we probably don't want to embed that because we're going to run into that 20 megabyte limit, right? So if that's what you're getting at with cardinality, if you have, you know, something else you want to, uh, uh, specifically, uh, we talk about. I'm happy to do that. Awesome. Um, also, can you please elaborate on semantic with NoSQL database? So I'm, I'm seeing that question. I'm seeing a capital S there. So there may be something called semantic that I'm not familiar with, but I, I did talk about, um, yeah, key value recommendations. And semantic is just a fancy word that says it has meaning to it, right? as opposed to a GUID, which is just kind of randomly assigned or, or some sort of ID number, which is arbitrarily assigned. Having a semantic key is going to give you some of these benefits where it's human readable, uh, where it's, you know, in some cases a natural key, or you can use it to build deterministic key value access. That's, that's all I meant by that. Unless you mean some specific semantic product, which I don't know about, that's, that's what I meant with semantic. I love it. Well, I'll let the questioner add any additional comments if they would like to expand on that. So, um, Matthew, what types of joins does Couchbase support? So, Couchbase supports uh, all the typical joins that you'd use to from relational world, inner join, outer join. Uh, I showed you Nest, which is an interesting type of join that's available to JSON data. Um, uh, so inner join, outer, left outer join. Um, you know, I, I, I think that about co that covers it. I don't think we support right technically, uh, which is just the opposite of left. Um, um, 
yeah, I don't, I'm this, there's also, uh, you know, multi, you can join on multiple fields, right? Just like you could in relational, you can join on the keys, you can join on a combination of those things. Yeah. Uh, someone else just followed up subquery table expression supported. Yes, you can absolutely do subqueries. You can do common table expressions. The with syntax is there, for instance. Very cool. So um, I think we have time for a couple more questions here. So do we have an option to restrict data access? Restrict data access. Okay, so um, as far as authorization, yes, you can uh, create users that have permissions to, you know, just certain buckets, just certain scopes, just certain collections. Uh, absolutely, that's something that's built into Couchbase. Um, and you can restrict, uh, you know, do I want read access, write access, do I query access, uh, all those sorts of, you know, full text search access. You can restrict all those things individually. Um, and has Couchbase, um, have you been using it in the healthcare medical patient database or um, does the 20 megabyte limit become a problem for certain imaging types? Well, so I know Couchbase has been used uh, in the healthcare industry. We have several customers. Uh, and I, I believe uh, if you're familiar with the FHIR uh, data format, F-H-I-R, which is a standard JSON format for the healthcare industry, we, you know, we're a natural fit for that because it's a JSON database. Now, as far as imaging docs, the 20 megabyte limit would be a problem, you know, if you wanted to store, uh, you know, large binaries in Couchbase, for instance, which again, I would recommend against using Couchbase for that. And I would say Couchbase would be good for metadata, right? And actual text, you know, data that you can put in JSON format, be very useful for that. But the actual images and, and videos and scans and uh, things like that, I, would, I wouldn't necessarily want to use those for Couchbase. Not saying our customers don't, uh, don't store that type of stuff in Couchbase, but it's just really, I don't think it's the best use case for that. I love it. So I'm going to slip in one last question here. Sure. Um, what, uh, or how do you split the data across nodes? Do you use partitioning to define which data is stored in each node? So that's a really excellent question. And thank you for asking it. Um, Couchbase is kind of unique in NoSQL databases in that we do use uh, sharding, uh, which is another word for partitioning. However, the sharding is completely automatic. So as a developer, as a DBA, you don't have to go in and define those, uh, those shards, those partitions and manage those and rebalance those yourself. Uh, Couchbase will actually use a hashing algorithm based on the document key uh, that will then automatically assign it to one of the shards. And those, those shards, it's, it's a fixed number of shards that's spread across all the data nodes. So it's completely automatic and um, just not something you have to, to deal with as a developer. Um, so I, it's, and that also means that every data node in Couchbase uh, can handle both reads and writes. So it's not a primary secondary type of architecture. It is a uh, shared nothing architecture or masterless architecture just relatively unique in, in the database world. That is very cool. I think that's the first time we've been asked that in, uh, as, since you've been doing these webinars with us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's very cool. And, and, and actually there's me time for one more question because sure. I got to get them all in Matthew, you know. Um, <laughs> data masking and internal encryption, uh, data at rest capabilities. Okay, yes. Uh, so with Couchbase Capella, this uh, is a fully managed uh, cloud-based uh, uh, you know, database as a service. And so this takes advantage of whatever uh, data at rest capabilities that the, that the cloud provides, right? Whatever cloud operator is on provides, right? So I'm on AWS, so I'm not an AWS guy. I just, I don't know what it's called, but there is a data at rest uh, service that, uh, that that uses to store it at rest. Yes, uh, data masking. Uh, if you want to get more granular, the Couchbase SDKs support something called field level encryption. So if, you, if you're storing, you know, say 20 fields of JSON and you want to encrypt one of them, uh, you can also do that. And that's another form of, of data at rest encryption of a specific field, right? So even if that, all that data gets uh, somehow um, leaked um, as the raw JSON, it's still going to be, that field is going to be encrypted. Yes, and of course, uh, data in motion will be encrypted as well, TLS, uh, between the nodes uh, to and from Couchbase cluster itself. Yeah. 
Perfect. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for another great presentation with us. And thanks to our community for being so engaged in everything we do. I just love it. So just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Matthew, thank you so much. And thanks to Couchbase for sponsoring another great webinar. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks.